for us. Uh, it's a pleasure having uh, Mr. Abushadi here with us today. Uh, he is, as uh, Firas mentioned, he's one of the leading Palestinian members of the Knesset. Uh, and uh, he's someone who has often been accused by uh, uh, Zionists of being an extremist. Uh, <laughs> he has uh, supported, actually, because of his challenges to the uh, Israeli Zionist mindset and uh, his emphasis on Palestinian rights and on equality and justice uh, for the Palestinian people. And what's even more interesting from what I've heard about him is that he also not only speaks fluent Arabic and English, but he also speaks fluent Hebrew and he often debates uh, his uh, Israeli critics in, uh, in Hebrew and the Knesset. Uh, we are delighted to have you, and thank you for being with us uh, today. I think this is going to be a very interesting uh, session, and welcome to the uh, to you uh, in the audience. Uh, we welcome your questions also, uh, so please uh, do not hesitate uh, uh, to uh, you know ask any questions you you like. Uh, uh, you relate, as long as it's related to to the topic that we're talking about today. Uh, Mr. Abu Shadi, please uh, you know, begin if you want to speak for about 10, 15 minutes, uh, and then I have some questions, and then we'll open it to the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gharib, for this uh, important chance to talk uh, to your honorable uh, audience. Uh, I would like to concentrate my, uh, my, my 10 minutes to a little bit bring to the to the minds of the audience, uh, the, the forgotten 1.7 million Palestinians who are the, the citizens of Israel. Unfortunately, when I when usually talk to, to foreign audience, uh, most of the audience, uh, either they don't know anything about the existence of 20% of the Israeli citizens, 1.7 million Palestinians, or if they do know, they do know very little about our existence and our issues. So uh, I would like to concentrate my few minutes on uh, the Arab Palestinian citizens of the state of Israel. Usually most of the world, when they think about Israel, Palestine, uh, they think um, in, in two different separated geographies or two pieces of geography. And they think that the Palestinians are living in the area which is called nowadays uh, Gaza, the West Bank and East Jerusalem. And uh, the Jews lives inside the, the, the green line. And this is what usually people uh, think or know more or less. Uh, but we are living in the state of Israel as a minority. We, we, we were not a minority before the Nakba. Before the Palestinian Nakba, we were the majority in our homeland. The state of Israel actually was built on the ruins of, of our homeland and of our people. And we became a minority in our homeland as a result of the 1948 war, the, as a result of the Nakba. The Arab Palestinian minority in Israel uh, uh, suffers from all different kinds of, of, of racial uh, policies and of discrimination in all fields of life. If, if everything that you can check in numbers in the state of Israel, you can see huge gaps between the Jewish majority and the Arab Palestinian minority. Don't want to make you too tired with, with, with details and numbers, but in Israel, racism and discrimination is something you can see just by driving your car from one place to the other you, you can see racism all over, wherever you are going, in, in, in the south, in the Naqab area, in the Naqab desert, or in the central area, in cities like Yaffa, Lid, the Ramle, or if you go to the Triangle area, or you go to the north, wherever you pass with your car in the state of Israel, and you pass from a Jewish area to the Arab area, you don't, with, you don't need anyone telling you anything. You can see with your own eyes the differences and the gaps between the Palestinian minority and the, the, the Jewish minority who are both considered citizens of the state of Israel. The insistence of the Israeli state to see itself as a Jewish state or the state of the Jewish people is mainly our biggest challenge. This Jewish supremacy 
that the vast majority of the all the Zionist parties wants to keep here in this part of the world uh, is, has developed into a kind of a legitimate racism because unfortunately because this time in in, in their history the Jews are the, the not the victims of racism but the victimizers here in this in this part of the world most of the world don't want to see this simple fact uh, we in in my party in my any political movement we see the term jewish democracy as an oxymoron we don't see these two things going together we see that the two terms contradicts each other and we believe that it cannot exist as a jewish and democratic state in the same time israel cannot be both in the same time because as long as they want to see themselves as a jewish state it means they want to give more to part of the population on the account of the other part of the population and this is what's happening here in israel in all fields of life the state of israel gives more to the jewish majority and ignores the existence of the Palestinian minority. Sometimes they deal with us as enemies, as you have seen in the late May, May, May 2021 events, where the state was shooting us in demonstrations. Or sometimes they deal with us as uh, low-class citizens in different issues. Uh, in, inside the state of Israel, uh, Arab Palestinians and Jews lives on total racial separation. Nearly 90% of the population in the state of Israel lives on racial separation. I don't know if there's a similar case, by the way, nowadays in anywhere in the world where 90% of the population lives on total racial separation. Tel Aviv is the most famous enlightened uh, is, uh, city in Israel. Uh, nearly don't have Arab. Uh, Arab uh, population. Uh, but other big cities like uh, Rishon Letzion, Cholon, uh, Ramat Gan, uh, Givatayim is 100% Jewish. Uh, less than 10% of the population lives in what is called mixed cities where, where I live in. Cases like Yaffa, Haifa, Akka, Lid, Ramle, less than 10%. But also inside these mixed cities, you can also see racial separation. My children and my neighbor's children go to different schools. We live in the same building, but our children go to different schools. There is separation in the official separation in the education system in Israel. So you see racism and discrimination in everything that you can check. You can see the numbers uh, in, in everything, in the academy, in different universities, in the economic uh, section, you can see what's happening in banking, uh, uh, politics, uh, culture, sports, everything. And uh, we see that there's a very big problem, challenge for us as a Palestinian minority. And my party, the Balad party, we, we, we brought a solution for this challenge. Our solution is to make Israel a normal democracy. This is why, <laughs> Dr. Gharif, this is why we are considered very extreme in Israel. Because we fight for justice and equality for all, making Israel, instead of being a racist Jewish state that prefers part of the population on the other part of the population, because we are struggling for justice and equality for all, to change the political system into a normal democracy, a state that would deal with you as a citizen. Now, whether if you pray like a Jew or you pray like a Christian or all, you don't pray at all, it's your problem between you and God. Your rights as a citizen should not be given to you because you pray in a certain way or your grand grandfather used to pray in a certain way in Ukraine in the 19th century. Now, we, we are challenging this racist component of the political regime in Israel that prefers Jews on, on the other part of, on, on, on our account, the indigenous, the indigenous community. 
And we believe that Israel should become the state of all its citizens. Simply a normal democracy, which is built on justice, equality, and human rights for all the citizens. Because of that, we are challenging the Zionist component of the state. We are considered the most extreme political party in Israel. And we are accused all the time of being extreme and, and so on. Meanwhile, unfortunately, unfortunately, you said, Annie, that a lot of people talks about the, the Palestinian partner for, for, for the peace talks. I think there is a Palestinian partner. I think the problem is that there is no Israeli partner from the and Zionist parties that uh, believes in, in, in justice and equality for all. And this is our biggest challenge. Now we face this in our daily, in our daily life, in, in, in our daily work as, as members of the, of the Israeli Knesset. But I, I will stop here my talk to you. And if you have any questions, we can address the questions. And in the end, if I feel something missing, I can, I, I can when I summarize my talk, I will, I will bring all the other things. Thank, Thank you so much. Uh, this is a very thoughtful uh, and wide-ranging analysis for uh, 10 minutes or, about, or thereabouts, so thank you very much. Uh, I was originally going to start actually by focusing a little bit on President Biden's visit, but let me go actually to the topic that you just spoke about, uh, which I think is our, uh, the, you know, the core issue right, right now that uh, I would like to start with. Uh, as you know, American politicians uh, often uh, and friends of Israel and the U.S. keep emphasizing that Israel is a democracy, is the only democracy in the Middle East. Uh, well, I would like to ask, is Israel a democracy? From what you've said, it doesn't seem to be that, uh, that way. Why not? And is it, uh, uh, in fact, only a democracy for the Jewish population of Israel? Uh, and... Uh, uh, why is it that whenever, if this is the case, uh, then the issue of, or the criticism so that we hear sometimes from uh, some voices in the West, that Israel is an apartheid state, uh, and those people who raise that are often denounced uh, very fiercely. Uh, so uh, could you go a little bit more into this issue and how... Uh, how, how is Israel a, a democracy? Is it, in some ways, it appears to be a democracy, especially uh, for the Jewish community. But when it comes to the Palestinian Israelis, that may be a different story. Well, uh, th th thank you, Dr. Gharib. Israel calls itself a Jewish democracy. Uh, it's, it's, it's a kind of a democracy for the Jews. But for us, the indigenous community, it's a, Jew it's a Jewish state. For us, it's a Jewish state. For them, it might be a democracy, but I don't think that the two things can go together because the, and it, Israel was established on the account, on the ruins of, of, of the Palestinian people. And most of its population till now lives in a state of mind of denial that in order to build this Jewish state, the Palestinians passed a serious Nakba that totally crushed the Palestinian people and destroyed our dream for a nation state. And it's continuing since 1948 till now. But I think before getting into too much detail, just by definition, a, a Jewish democracy can never be a normal democracy. A state that prefers people or part of its population because they were born from the majority point of view to the, to the right race. On the other part of the population that from the majority point of view was born for the wrong race can never bring equality between its citizens. By definition, there is no chance for equality for us inside this state. And Israel, imagine this very complex situation. Israel says that this state is state for all the Jews all over the world, which means that the majority of the citizens in this part of the world are citizens in potential. They are living abroad 
And so Israel is a state for a lot of people who are not its citizens. They live as American citizens, uh, European citizens, Australian citizens, Jews all over the world. But in the same time, it is not the state of all its citizens because we are not Jewish. We are Palestinians. Now, this makes it an impossible for such an entity to, to, to and also on, on, by definition or in theoretical level, to be a democracy, but not just in theory, Dr. Gharib. If you check the numbers, in anything that you want to do comparison between Arabs and Jews, living as citizens inside this state, there are 60 laws that discriminate against the Arab Palestinian minority who are citizens of the state of Israel. You can check, we have a, an important legal NGO, it's called Adala. If you, if you check their website, you can see all the list of more than 60 laws that discriminates against the Arab Palestinian minority who are citizens of the state of Israel. If we take just, for example, few important laws, and like in any, in any, any state in the world, the most important law is citizenship. We have discrimination in citizenship. All Jews can be citizens whenever they like to, okay? They can return after, according to their story, after 2000 years in exile. My family that was expelled in 1948, my family, my own family, they can't get back because they were born to their own grace from the state point of view. If you see the last uh, uh, racist uh, nation state law that Israel made in 2018, that totally ignores our existence and our collective rights here, says that Israel is only a nation state for the Jews. If you see the last law before we went to, to the elections a few weeks ago that passed in the Israeli Knesset, is called uh, the Co Committee Acceptance Law. This is a law that wants to prevent Arab Palestinians from living in Jewish areas. So the law says that in certain areas, only Jews are allowed to live. And in order to go and buy a house there, you should pass an acceptance committee. And the acceptance committee has uh, certain terms in order to accept you to live in that area. One of the terms says that you should be suitable culturally. For the, for the people who are living there. I don't know if there are such, uh, such laws in anywhere now in the world. In Israel, we have racist laws that exist from the 19th century colonial world. I don't know if they, and the last thing I want to tell you any, about any, any Jew in the world can come to Israel and immediately become a citizen, get married with any Jewish girl or a boy, whatever he likes. I am not allowed to get married or to be in love with a girl from Ramallah, 60 kilometers far from Yapa, and bring her to live with me. Arab Palestinian families, uh, there's a blow that prevents us from family unifications in Israel. And nobody sees this racism. The fact that the state want to decide for me with whom to be in love, with whom not to be in love, does not look bad in the Jewish majority mind. Such a state could never be a democracy. I think most of the supporters of Israel that talks about Israel, this myth of the only democracy in the Middle East, don't know anything about how, how, how does our life look like as citizens inside the state. I wish, I wish they would come for a visit and just pass with their car from one place to the other and see what I am talking about. I think most of the support comes from things that got nothing to do with the Israeli reality. And this is what really has uh, a lot of the world important human rights and George has discovered that in the last two years with this, I'm going to, to finish this and answer to your question, Dr. Gharib. 
something very big and important happened. In the last two years, five different reports from different NGOs, different institutions, very important ones, says that Israel is an apartheid state. Now, it started with an Israeli human rights NGO, by the way, Betselim, and then we had another very important report by the Human Rights Watch, very important uh, NGO that talks about the human rights. Then we had another very important report from Amnesty International. Then another very important report from Harvard, uh, low, low, uh, Human Rights Clinic in the Law School of Harvard. And then another independent report from the UN. In two years, five different reports from very important institutions says that this is an apartheid what's happening on there. I wish those who are supporting Israel would read at least one of these reports to see how does this political entity works in all of historical Palestine, not just in the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, but also towards its own population, its own Arab Palestinian citizens. And you, you can see a lot of proofs that say that this this is not a democracy, and Israel is very far from being a democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, why, why do you think Western governments uh, look the other way, as you, you were just pointing out to these reports that just came out? Uh, they seem to look the other way or are blind when it comes to injustices and human rights violations committed against the Palestinians. You, are, you were recently uh, in the United States and you spoke with a number of uh, Americans as well as Palestinians and people of different uh, backgrounds. I don't know if you've raised this question with them. Uh, how much of it do you think maybe it has to do with the Israel lobby, with the strong support of um, you know, of uh, the lobby for members of Congress? I mean, there's and how do you think this is likely to change? What can be done? I mean, what are you doing first on the ground inside uh, Israel to bring about change? And how has the Israeli community, for example, one interesting, one curious thing for me, I would like, uh, do you get Jewish voters to vote for you, for example? Do Arab Palestinians, in Israel who are in the Knesset, do they get Israeli voters to vote for them? Or is it only uh, basically Arab Palestinians who uh, uh, vote for them? And uh, how, how are we likely to see change as a result of this? I mean, you have been recently there, you were an activist before you joined, became a member of the Knesset. Uh, do you think that the, your experience in the Knesset uh, you know, gives you a different view, a different light on what's going on and what could be done? Okay, we have three different questions. First of all, uh, regarding the Western blind support of Israel and continuing to sue Israel as a democracy, this comes from a lot of different reasons. In the state, it's different than in Europe. Uh, states in 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 in, in in the United States, it's a little bit different because of religious reasons and also because of cultural reasons. I think that uh, in the vast public opinion, uh, uh, American public opinion uh, thinks that Israel is a microcosm of, 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 of their own experience, of, of, of the American experience of people immigrating from Europe to the undeveloped areas of the world and building their democracy and so on and so on. This is why they have a lot of support. I think most of this support comes out of ignorance. And this is why I think we as Palestinians, we have the interest that the world would know the truth. I think by yani, bringing our perspective to the, to the world, eh, they will see Israel in a totally different way. They, they are going to see it from the victim's uh, point of view of, of, of the Zionist project and its evils. Uh, this is totally different. Uh, part of the support of the, of, of, of the Western world is also because the Western world is racist and they don't care much about 
non-Europeans who are suffering. It doesn't mean, and I usually ask this question to the ambassadors of uh, different Western uh, states. I tell them, you see everything here. You, and you come here, you see everything. You see the gaps and the discrimination and, 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 and you see the, the separation wall and you see that Gaza is under siege for a long time and you see uh, racist policies in all fields of life and you see the occupation and people getting uh, killed daily. You see all this. Why aren't we see ch and seeing changes in your policies? They tell me, yes, Sammy, we see and we send reports to our states. But first of all, there's strong uh, Zionist lobbies in the different Western states that brings a totally different narrative. Uh, second, they started much before than we did. So we are, and it, they were able to, to, to construct the public opinion it's much more difficult to change the public opinion. But things are changing. Things are changing and people are starting to see any different things. I think the best way is to bring the Palestinian narrative, which is my point of view, much closer to the truth, to the world, to let them understand what does it mean to live in such a, a, a Jewish democracy. How does this affect our lives in all different parts of, of Palestine? This is the way to do it, but it's going to take some time. It's going to take some time because you are not telling a new story for the people. The people knows already something which is far from the truth in our point of view. So we are aiming at changing their opinions this will take more time. And I think the more people would know about Israel, the more we are going to see how Israel will be brought out of the democratic club. Now, regarding our voters, we have very small uh, Jewish minority that supports our project in Balad party or in the communist party. But I have to say that this minority are very special people. We are talking about few thousands, but this few thousands are really, we have very high respect to them because they are working in a very complicated situation. And the vast majority of the Jews deals with them as someone that crossed the borders to the other side. Jews who are a political activists in the state of Israel and they support our struggle for justice and equality are a small minority, but great people that are ready to pay very high price for their beliefs and for their struggle for justice and equality. Because their families, uh, their neighbors start dealing with, with them as, as people who cross the borders to the other side. So they pay much higher price than I do. Uh, so we have very high respect for them. Uh, for your last question regarding, as a member of the Knesset, where do I see a change? If, if, if there's a possibility for change. Well, I think that the Israeli Jewish society has been deteriorating very fast in the last two decades for becoming a fascist society. It's getting used uh, to violence. And uh, most of the voters, the vast majority are in the right and the extreme right. Uh, we are also seeing different uh, components of a fascist regime like uh, making Netanyahu a god of their own and uh, the way they are dealing with their uh, leader and uh, they are narrowing a lot the what could be dealt with as a democratic margins uh, and there's a lot of attacks on the legal institutions of the state and on the uh, Israeli Supreme Court and uh, so things are becoming much more dangerous in the state of Israel. But this uh, should not make us pessimistic and, and on the contrary, 
this says that our political activity is becoming much more important because you need someone that would stop this deterioration towards fascism and towards violence and you need a political uh, trend political movement that would open a different horizon for the population to tell the people that there's a different solution uh, which is built on justice and equality for all that we aim at changing this racist situation into a more democratic situation i we don't see a lot of of of, of hope in the in, in in the coming next few years but we are aware of that we are seeing the change and we are trying to stop this fascist deterioration and to to open a, a, a democratic horizon for the population sounds weird in this very complicated situation but this is our main political work so that's uh, actually that's fascinating and one of the interesting things is that you as you pointed out earlier why first of all the palestinian issue despite all of what's been going on is not as well known as people think there are also a lot of stereotypes but uh, when it comes even to pal palestinians in israel they are there is less known about them than about the other. And you, Palestinians uh, uh, in Israel, were seen at one time as one of the quietest Palestinian communities. But in the last couple of years or so, it seems, or if you maybe even the last decade or so, we're seeing more activism uh, on the part of this community. Yes. To what do you attribute? Is First of all, is this true? And secondly, to what do you attribute this change that's taking place? How are the political dynamics affecting this uh, new uh, attitude or this new situation? Well, you, you reminded me was a very important work done by Professor Ayan Lustig. I think he's Jewish American, by the way. I'm not sure. I think he's Jewish American or Canadian. He came to visit Israel at the end of the 1980s. And, and he passed from one place to the other. He was visiting the state. Then he saw discrimination and racism towards the Arab Palestinian minority in everything that he, he has seen. So he came up with a very important research. He works a lot in the, on, on different minority issues. So his, his main question was that, why is this minority so quiet? If Israel claims being a, a democracy, and there is a discrimination and racism towards the Arab Palestinians in all fields of life. Why are all these Palestinians so quiet? And his main explanation was, and I feel it, it, it still exists, that uh, first of all, between 1948 and 1966, Israel dealt with us as enemies. We, are, we were living under military control. We, Arab Palestinian citizens, inside the state of Israel, for two decades, we were living under military control. But after that officially they took up the military control, uh, they continued with another kind of uh, political regime, which is built on, on control and surveillance that still exists till today. For example, let me give you a few basic things. We, the Arab Palestinians, Israel do not acknowledge our national identity. From the state point of view, we do not have a national identity. We are only just small religious minorities. When I am telling you now that I'm, we are Palestinians, from the state point of view, I am lying to you. <laughs> because there are no Palestinian people in the official narrative. Our children, for example, are not allowed to study our history in, 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 in the Israeli schools. Our children are examined on modern Zionist history and they are not allowed to study Palestinian history. We study uh, in our schools uh, most of the topics in Hebrew, not in Arabic for a lot of reasons. Uh, we don't have one official TV channel, for example. 
one official radio channel. Okay, I'm talking about 2022. We don't have an Arab university. Uh, so this minority, compared to its of any objective situation is a very, very quiet minority. We are trying to struggle and change our future uh, using different tools and political activity, which is considered legal and, and, and legitimate. It is a very uh, quiet minority. Uh, lately, people are knowing about us more mainly because of the social media that got into the mm -hmm. into the world so you you see us not in only in, in 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 the official tv channel or official radio channels you 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 can watch our activity uh, through the social media and also i think that the palestinian people has rediscovered this palestinian minority lately uh, so they know about us a little bit a little bit more, but still, uh, we are not doing enough that the people would know more about us and about our issues and about our sufferings and so on. Uh, and it's, 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 it's taking some time because uh, we don't see the Israeli foreign policies representing our interests and our voices. Uh, so, and, and, and we don't want to be part of the, the, the Israeli Hasbara. So, and, and we work with very, very small resources. So things are taking us more, uh, more time. It's very slow. Yeah, actually, let me ask you a question about since you raised the about uh, students, for example. Is Palestinian history taught in any of the schools? I mean, uh, are, do you see, for example, that, uh, you know, that, or is it just simply teaching of Zionist history or Ju Israeli Jewish history? Um, you know, and there's, a, there's an atmosphere of, uh, of, of, of terror and fear, Dr. Gharib, in our education system. Let me give you a personal uh, example. Uh, I finished my PA at the end of the 1990s, and I I taught uh, for one year in my school, which is a private school, that Beani, it's a, a Catholic uh, church school, it's called Terra Santa. And I taught for one year history and political science. Now the curriculum uh, made me uh, teach the Zionist uh, narrative and Zionist history. But on the same time, I was telling the students also the Palestinian narrative. So after a few months, uh, my headmaster brought me to a meeting uh, and told me, uh, Sammy, uh, I had orders from the above, as if God was talking to him, uh, that uh, if next year you will be teaching in my school, I will have problems in my budget. And he brought me out of school because I was telling the Palestinians that they are Palestinians, that they should do their history. Now, this is how the state is running uh, a, a, a terror atmosphere at schools. So people know very little about their own history. I mean, this is fascinating, in fact. And you know, that reminded me of something you mentioned earlier about the Palestinians living under uh, military rule for a long time. Uh, uh, Netanyahu at one time said that uh, he considers the Palestinians in Israel, the, uh, the 20% that you were talking about, uh, that they are, they pose more of a strategic threat to Israel than yeah. the Palestinians in the West Bank or Gaza. That's very interesting. Why do you think so? Do you, I mean, from what you're saying, it's very interesting that they don't want even the students to learn their history. And they have, uh, so uh, there is this kind of uh, almost trying to, uh, eradicate uh, the Palestinian presence. I mean, at least in, if not in reality, at least in education and other areas. So what, why, and by the way, why did, uh, why does not someone like Netanyahu, did he ever explain that? Uh, why did he consider the Palestinians inside uh, posing more of a threat, strategic threat uh, 
uh, than those in the West Bank or Gaza. You know, uh, Dr. Gharib, I think the problem is not Netanyahu. You know, when Netanyahu said this uh, famous sent uh, sentence that uh, he, he deals with us as, as the biggest strategic threat for the Jewish state, in the same day, there was a very important discussion between two very uh, important figures in the Israeli Zionist politics. Dr. Yesi Balin, presenting the extreme left, and uh, Lieberman presenting the extreme right. They were brought for important talk show in Israel, and he asked them, what do they think about this sentence that at that time Netanyahu saying that we are uh, a, a big strategic threat for the state. So Lieberman came ready to the talk show, brought out the map. He said, I was saying this much before Netanyahu and we should bring, we should expel these people or we should transfer them from the Israeli state to the Palestinian state if they don't accept and all this racist way of thinking. What did Mr. Extreme Left say, Dr. Yossi Berlin? He said that he agrees with Netanyahu and Lieberman on the problem. He disagrees on the solution, <laughs> which means that there's a kind of consensus between all the Zionists that we are a problem. Our existence is a problem, okay? The fact that we bring children to the world is a problem, okay? In the Israeli political discourse, uh, they call my children demographic bomb. Now they don't know what will be the future of my children, but my Naji and my Sama, because they were born to the wrong race, are considered a demographic bomb. My neighbor's children are called a blessing. The fact that Jews bring children to the world is called a blessing. Hit barachnu, they say in, in Hebrew. Hit barachnu with, 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 with the birth of ex Jewish children. And our children is considered a demographic bomb. No. And you, this is crazy, but, but, but this is facts in Israel. This is how they deal with us. Uh, so the issue is not Netanyahu. The issue, uh, Dr. Gharib, in my point of view, is that Zionism is like other settler colonial projects. All settler colonial projects wanted to eradicate the, the, the indigenous population. The Israelis were not able to kill as much as they would have loved, would have loved to do. So, so they are doing it differently. They are destroying our heritage. They are destroying our culture. There was a few months ago, the heritage minister in Israel Elkin was on the radio and they were asking him about uh, different kinds of that to do with heritage and Arab Palestinian heritage or so on. So he, he said that in, to the interviewer, what are you talking about? The goals of the heritage ministry is only to keep and develop Jewish heritage. This is the goal of the ministry. The other, other heritages that exist in this very old important part of the world are not important. They don't deserve to be preserved or developed. They are continuing till today, trying to destroy our identity. The fact that I am telling you that I'm a Palestinian from their point of view is considered something extreme to do. In fact, are, are you, are Palestinians are the, said to be Israeli Arabs. They don't say Palestinians who are living. Yeah, in... we are called we are called the, the Arabs of Israel, as if Israel has its own Arabs, you know. And because we are the Arabs of Israel, our history starts after 1948. Before 1948, we don't have history. <laughs> our history, according to their narrative, starts with the existence of the establishment of the Israeli state. Our history before is not considered that one.
And they don't also explain why is my cousin, for example, who was expelled in 1948, he is a Palestinian, but I am not at the same time. I mean, that, that's, that's really uh, unbelievable. But let me ask you about the Israeli elections, actually. Israel is going towards elections. Uh, you are running uh, the Israeli government. Uh, yeah. What are the challenges uh, that are likely to face uh, the uh, electorate, and per particularly the Palestinians uh, in Israel? And uh, especially when it comes to these kinds of like having uh, coalitions. Yeah. We, we, we heard a lot about some of the coalitions that took place uh, during the last uh, the last period. How do you see it evolving? Where do you see it going? Uh, what do you expect, I mean, from this, uh, uh, from this coming election? Well, uh, Israel is going for the fifth election in less than four years. And I was elected first to the Knesset in 2019. Since then, I'm in a campaign. <laughs> It's, uh, this is my, my fifth election in less than four years. Uh, first of all, the explanation for that, it's, uh, it's not a serious political crisis because it's not that there's a very serious political discussion between different political trends uh, that are competing on, 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 on how to control the state. Uh, the issue here is that there's a very powerful character in the Israeli political system. His name is Benjamin Netanyahu. And the man is taking the state from one elections to the other because he have a few criminal files and he wants to have a coalition that will keep him out of court. All this powerful, important, big state, yes, this is how things are, are, are happening now in Israel. There is really no need for fifth election in less than four years. And unfortunately, in the Israeli political system, there is no serious different political alternatives. And if you read the different political programs of the Israeli parties, you don't see any serious changes. You know, first of all, there are a lot of different kinds of Likud. And you have the Likud big party, uh, headed by Benjamin Netanyahu, but you have all, a lot of other parties that started their way in the Likud and they had personal issues with Netanyahu, so they left. Uh, Lieberman's party, for example, Lieberman was, was the, the man who was running Netanyahu's office for a few years. So they think the same, but they have personal issues. Uh, Gidon Saar, he has six seats. He was the second man in the Likud. He's not that different from Netanyahu. Uh, Ayelet Shaked and, and, and Naftali Bennett, they were also with him in the, in, 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 in the Likud. So you have a lot of different kinds of Likud. This is why there is no serious political uh, discussion between the different Zionist parties. The only ones who are presenting a different political program and a different political discourse uh, are the joint list. We are three different political parties that came together that built the joint list. And we are uh, building a different political program that wants to end the Israeli occupation and uh, to bring equality between all the Israeli citizens. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, friends, we don't have partners with, with, with other Israeli political parties on the margins here and there. Sometimes we can have some uh, agreements with, 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 with merits, but in general, we are very far from all the different Zionist parties. And because there, there is no serious Israeli party that talks about the important issues, that wants to end the Israeli occupation, that wants to end the Jewish supremacy, that uh, wants to bring equality and justice, uh, we find it very hard to go for the elections and we find it very hard to convince our audience to participate in the elections. Well, the biggest challenge for us nowadays, uh, Dr. Gharib, 
is that we are expecting very low uh, participation by the Arab Palestinian minority in the Israeli elections. People simply uh, lost hope uh, in the Israeli political system. This is very dangerous in my point of view, by the way, for the future well, of I the state and society. Uh, absolutely, but what's being done about it? I mean, to, are you, for example, are you, what are you doing uh, about it on the ground? First of all, we work a lot with our audience. We are on all the time in the field with our audience all the time because uh, the, the Arab Palestinian minority, as I said, suffers from all kinds of different racist policies. So you have houses demolitions all the time, daily, daily. It happens daily. On a daily basis, the state destroys houses of Arab Palestinian citizens. Uh, there's a lot of violence in our community lately, and the state is doing nothing for that. Uh, we are in a lot of demonstrations. We we do a lot of political meetings. We try to convince the people not to lose hope. Uh, and we try also to convince them with our political agenda and to try to tell them that we, maybe we cannot do much in order to change the past, but, but, but we can do a lot to change the, the future. And the fact that things are terrible lately uh, only should encourage us to do more, not to do less. But as you know, in political participation uh, research, people participate more when they believe in their ability to influence things and to bring change. In this uh, racist political system, it's, it's, it's very hard to promise the people that we can do that. First of all, all Israeli Zionist parties tell you they don't want to have the joint list in the coalition because the joint list struggles for equality. Do not accept inferiority for the Arab Palestinian minority. They do not, they are not ready to accept that uh, Israel can be a Jewish and a democratic state in the same time. Because of that, we, we, they don't deal with us as partners. They don't deal with us as a legitimate player in the political system at all. Because we believe that without equality, you can, you can never have a democracy. They, they are ready to live with the fact that there is a Jewish supremacy and they see it, they see it as, a, as a legitimate thing. They don't, they don't criticize it. Yeah, well, I wanted to ask you about, uh, you mentioned that there is violence within the Arab Israeli, Palestinian Israeli community. Uh, to what I've actually, a friend of mine asked me when I was talking, telling him about that we were going to be having uh, this presentation and discussion today. Uh, he said that he is very much concerned. He hears that he's been hearing that there is a great deal of there are you know killings of the rise in number of murders. Is this true? How how widespread is it? And why do you think this is this is happening? It is true. This is our biggest challenge nowadays, Doctor Gharib. Uh, the numbers are crazy. I mean, we are a small minority. Uh, in the last uh, 10 years, uh, nearly 1,000 people were killed. Uh, and the organized crime is controlling everything in our societies lately. They are becoming the most powerful power and they are controlling everything in our cities and villages. Now, everyone that knows Israel knows that Israel is a very, very big army uh, that have a very, very small state. And everybody knows that if Israel can kill uh, scholars in, uh, in Tehran, they surely can uh, uh, deal with organized crime uh, in, 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 in our society. If you ask yourself, why aren't they doing anything? This is because of the racist dimension of, that I was talking about. Because in their point of view, our life worthless. This is the only explanation. You know, any these criminals, why don't they get angry 
on, on Jews also. Why do they kill only Arabs? How can, how, how can we understand this phenomena that nearly all their victims are Arab Palestinians? We are the minority here. Why don't they attack the majority? Because all the Israeli police and the different security systems has drawn a very clear red line for them, telling them, if you attack Arabs, nobody will ask you questions. If you kill Arabs, nobody will ask you questions. But if you do dare to attack Jews, you will be facing a totally different police system. In numbers, Dr. Gharib, you can see that. Historically, there were a few small number of Jews that were killed by Arabs. All of these Arabs were caught by the police. All of them. You don't have one single case that when the victim was a Jew and the criminal was an Arab, the criminal was not caught. In the same time, when the victim is an Arab, more than 60 or 70% of the cases, nobody gets caught. Israel simply deals with our lives that they mean less and they're worthless. Now, this is bringing a lot of anger, a lot of fear, a lot of terror atmosphere in our society. And this is one of the most important reasons why people are not going to vote. People are, are terrified, frustrated, and they don't know what to do. They simply don't know what to do. I mean, the, the state of Israel has decided to leave the Arab-Palestinian minority for the uh, mafia gangs uh, controlling everything. Now, this organized crime came to us from the Russian mafia. When Israel brought Russian immigration in the 1990s after the fall of the Soviet Union, they came also with their culture of crime. And they started spreading organized crime, first of all, in the Israeli Jewish majority areas. But the state saw this as a big strategic threat and then in two years decided to give a very hard strike for all the organized crime in the Jewish society. In two years, they were able to control it again in areas like Natania, Naharia, and other Jewish areas. But then the crime came to our own Arab areas. And when it was concentrated in Arab areas, the state decided to do nothing. Uh, so numbers are very, very big in our uh, society. And, uh, you know, we can deal with violence. And we are fighting and struggling against violence. But uh, there is no chance that regular citizens uh, can deal with organized crime. This is the main work of the state. Well, I think this is this is uh, amazing, and this is where the, probably there's a need for the community itself, maybe, to uh, unite and work against these uh, uh, mafias. If, uh, but uh, that brings me to another question, and then we'll try to take some audience questions. Uh, you know, I've, there's been a number of reports recently about settlers attacking Palestine in the West Bank and. Uh, uh, maybe even in the southern part of uh, of, of Israel now, uh, and it seems that when the police, according to some of these reports that I've read about, uh, that uh, the pol police come and almost join almost in uh, the attacks on the Palestinians. Not, uh, not, not, not almost, not, not, not almost, Doctor Gharib. These settlers are accompanied in most of their attacks in the West Bank and East Jerusalem with Israeli army and on their attacks on Palestinian population within the Green Line by the Israeli police. You can see all their attacks. First of all, when you're talking about the attacks, we are talking about killings. 
they are killing Palestinians. They are burning their homes. They are burning our uh, plantations. These are daily attacks, daily attacks. It's happening and it's being supported by the Israeli army and the Israeli police. These uh, crazy settlers in the West Bank cannot do whatever they like without the defense of the Israeli army. Palestinians are able to defend themselves. But the issue is that these people are uh, usually comes with Israeli police and Israeli army, and they are defended by the Israeli army and police. And uh, we said about the deterioration of this state and society into fascism. Part of this deterioration happened with the control of Israeli settlers on all the important decision-making processes in Israel. The political force of the settlers nowadays, Israel is unbelievable compared to their to the number. They are represent nearly 10% of the population. Half of them are uh, religious Orthodox Jews. They don't involve in such attacks. So this 5% uh, are overrepresented in all the Israeli ministries. As a member of the Knesset, I can tell you that all the meetings I have in the Israeli ministers, uh, ministries, you see uh, overrepresentation of Israeli settlers, in the Israeli media, in the Israeli universities, in all the important decision-making processes. You see them all over. They have controlled a lot of the important positions in the Israeli Jewish state, and they have convinced the majority, who are not settlers, that Zionism is settlement. There is no difference that the meaning of Zionism is projects of settlers, and they are highly uh, supported also in the Israeli public opinion. Uh, they, they deal with, the, with their project as totally legitimate. They deal with their crimes as totally legitimate. And by the way, they are not just active in West Bank and East Jerusalem. There are settler uh, projects within the state of Israel. I live in, in, in Yaffa. And it's, co it's considered part of Tel Aviv, the big city of Tel Aviv, Jaffa, okay? In the Ajami neighborhood, we have a settler project, sir. In a 90% Arab population area, we have a closed settler project only for the Jews. Same in Lod, same in Akka, same in Haifa, same in Ramle. They have controlled everything in the state. Let me uh, take uh, some of the questions uh, here. One, of, one question that, uh, yeah, and uh, this goes back, related somewhat to the question I started asking earlier about your trip uh, to the United States. And what role, the question is, what role do you think the Palestinians in the United States, Palestinian Americans and uh, supporters of uh, uh, the Palestinian uh, uh, cause in general. What role do you think they can play? How do you think they can help? Uh, and can they do? What would you like to see them uh, do? First of all, I see the Palestinians in, in, in the States doing a lot strategically. Uh, I think that uh, they have a very important role. And uh, there's a lot of things that they can do which are very easy. First of all, to reconnect with Palestine, to come for a visit, uh, to know more about their history, about their uh, heritage, about the current situation in Palestine. This will help them to struggle in a, in, in a much stronger and better way. They should know more. And my, I think a visit to Palestine all over historical Palestine will give them a lot of material uh, to think about and to learn, and it will make them uh, able to promote their questions, to, 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 to develop their questions, to, 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 to know how to deal, tackle the different questions and issues that got to do with Palestine. 
So this is one thing to do. It's very easy. It's very important. Lately, there are a few different projects trying to do that. You can do it through these projects or you can do that individually, but it's very important to reconnect. And if you, if, if you, if you can't come for a visit, you can uh, be in touch with different Palestinians who are uh, activists here on the land uh, through Facebook pages, Instagram pages, anything. Uh, just to, to have a, a direct connection with their homeland. Second, uh, just a second. Second, which is very important in my point of view, the United States is the most important uh, political area where we should have political activity after, after, after historical Palestine. This is a very important strategic point. This is the, the most powerful state which is supporting Israel and Israeli project and Israeli Zionist narrative. So doing a change there would strategically change our situation as Palestinian and everything we've got to do with our Palestinian question. The state is, is, is not another state. This is not another small European state and this is not China. The United States is so involved in our question. So this is the second most important area to try to do political change in. What can you do? You can do a lot. You can bring the Palestinian narrative that it will be more well-known. Uh, you, 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 you can tell your own story so people would know more. Uh, you, you, you can take a lot of the reports published by all the uh, human rights NGOs and bring it to the awareness of the American people. You can take the last five uh, different reports that deal with Israel as, as an apartheid and bring it more to the awareness of the American audience. And you should be involved more in American politics. You should be more involved in the American Democratic Party or if you would like to the, uh, be part of other parties uh, we should be doing more uh, work in the American Congress. We, we, we can do a lot. And, and, and the last thing I want, I want to offer for you uh, is that uh, you can support Palestinian important projects and activity happening here now. And, and, and in my first uh, grant I had when we were having a, a youth activity in Jaffa at the end of the 1990s, was by the Jerusalem Fund. At that time, Professor Hisham Sharabi uh, supported our work. And uh, the, the office I'm sitting in here uh, that belongs to the Yaffa Youth Movement, for example, one of our projects was also supported by the, 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 the Jerusalem Fund. This, this helps us a lot. Actually, this is, thank you for mentioning that, because actually this is what the Jerusalem fund, this is one of the basic uh, concerns, basic interests, actually. And as you mentioned, Professor Sharabi, by the way, he was my professor, and he was well, my the advisor uh, as he, well. He's, he's from Jaffa. <laughs> he's very important intellectual. We are very proud of his, and he, his, his, his academic work, but we also have, and you want to emphasize that he's also from Jaffa. <laughs> yeah. uh, he, he, was, he was amazing. I, mean, I also worked with him as uh, the assistant editor of the uh, Journal of Palestine Studies, which ah, he taban, did of course. For quite a while. And uh, he was, uh, I mean, uh, one, of the, one of the people who really made things change and he you know but uh, to go back to uh, to your uh, you, you 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 had two in the states two <laughs> are very important two from jaffa professor sharabi and professor <laughs> Brahim Abu Lugut. they did a lot of important work yeah yeah but uh, one of the one of the things that one of the questions that uh, i got now also is that uh, you know, what is happening between the Palestinians of 48 and the Palestinians of 67? Are we seeing more efforts to uh, work together, uh, to try to unite? Is there, what avenues are we likely to see? Uh, I think this is, uh, you know, there's a, quite a bit of interest in this uh, and to hear your perspective on it. Well, in the last uh, 
20 years, there are strategic changes in the relationship between the, the, the Palestinians. Okay, and Palestine is a very small piece of land geographically, Dr. Gharib. Uh, and, 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 and the fact that people are, are, are not connected on the, on the daily life is, is, is a result of the Israeli occupation and checkpoints and all this uh, crazy situation in uh, you know palestine in in a few hours with, the, with with your car you can pass all of the states you can pass all the important cities in, in one in one day just driving your car it's, it's uh, in the last 20 years there are a few very important strategic things happening first of all the arab palestinians citizens of israel are uh, doing a much bigger role uh, in in al quds in visiting Al-Aqsa Mosque and doing a lot of projects that got to do with their brothers in Al-Quds. Uh, this is helping a little bit to encourage uh, economic activity in Al-Quds. And also people are going and connecting more with Al-Aqsa Mosque and different religious important churches. And uh, uh, so this is one thing. Another very important thing we have nearly now tens of, of thousands of families that uh, inter, intermarried. So you can, uh, I live in Yafa, people got married from people who was uh, from Ramallah, from El Khalil, from Nablus, from different parts of our homeland. I mean, well, we are the same people, yani, part of us, same families, yani, like people who were expelled during the 1948 war from Yafa to Nablus. And now people are uh, and uniting again and meeting again. Uh, there are some, uh, on, on the margin, some also uh, common economic activity. Uh, Israel in the 1948 war uh, destroyed all the important Palestinian cities. So we are a very strange case where we are developing without any normal uh, modern city center in order to a little bit live this atmosphere of an Arab city, most of us go to different Palestinian cities. So those who are in the south from the Naqab, uh, you see them on the weekends going to Hebron. Uh, our central area, Yafa, Liddur, Ramle, we go to Ramallah. Uh, people from Nasra usually go to Jinin area or Nablus area. It, People from the Triangle area are very close to Nablus, so they go to Nablus. Uh, I see this, uh, yani, this thing as, as, as the most natural case that should happen. Uh, it's bringing a lot of people uh, together. It's uniting the Palestinian uh, people in, 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 in historical Palestine together. I think what could add a lot for this strategic relation uh, is uh, our relationship nowadays for uh, Palestinians abroad. This could be a very important strategic uh, development. Uh, it's happening lately, small numbers. I like to think that we're going to see more of that happening in order to, to unite the Palestinian people again, all of them in order to be able to be more powerful. Inshallah, it will happen. Uh, well, but let me uh, have a, another question. Is that uh, you know it's been about two weeks since President Biden's Middle East tour, uh, where he met with Israeli Palestinians and uh, later that he met with Arab leaders as well. What's your assessment of this visit, and how do you think who are the winners and losers in this visit? if there are any from your perspective. And what does this mean for the Palestinian people, this visit? Does it have... Uh, if, if, you, if you would see the Israeli newspapers that covered this visit of uh, uh, President Biden to the Middle East, if you would see who celebrated this visit, you will be totally convinced that we don't want to see any of this peace activity, American peace activity. Because those who were celebrating his visit were mainly all the weapon industry in Israel and cyber services, 
and destruction services. If this is the way Americans are seeing peace in the Middle East, we surely don't want this American peace. If the, and you ask me who, 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 who won and who lost, those who really did win are the Israeli uh, different uh, arms industry. These are the people who were celebrated this visit. The fact that he dealt in this very unrespectful way with the Palestinian issue and the Palestinian president says everything. The man met the Palestinian president by a mistake. He went to Bethlehem to pray and on the margins, he gave the Palestinian president 20 minutes. He started his talk saying that in order to be a Zionist, you don't need to be a Jew. Now, if the man sees himself as a Zionist, it means he is putting himself as our enemy. I, I, I don't know if, if he really understood what is the meaning of this sentence. And the fact that he did not want to, to, to meet Shirin Abu Aqle, American citizen family that was killed any while giving and doing her the duty as a journalist because, with the Israeli army, the, the, the whole way he dealt with it. I am sure if it was the opposite case, okay, I don't want, I, I, I'm against violence, but just for any to think about it. If it was the opposite case, if it was an American Jewish citizen that was killed by the Palestinian Muqawami, he would have dealt much differently with the whole issue. Also, President Biden see Palestinian lives worthless. And then you would see what was the talk in Saudi Arabia? What was the talk with, with Arab Arab? He was talking all the time about uh, weapon deals. If this is the way when they think about peace in the Middle East, this is the way they want to deal with peace, we don't want this Israeli or American peace. So those who won from the Biden's, President Biden's last visit to our area are all the people who were dealing with weapon industry. These are the real winners. No, uh, clearly, and the Israelis and this joint declaration, strategic declaration, what we heard a lot about, primarily brought uh, a great deal of also gains for the Israeli in terms of weapons, new weapons, in terms of missile system, in terms of uh, 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 technological cooperation, as well as uh, the reaffirmation of the one billion dollars uh, for a year for additional for 10 years that was uh, uh, agreed upon. So there are a number of issues uh, here, but uh, let me go. But on. all of them, all the issues talks about missiles and cyber and, and weapon industry and, 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 and 10, billion, 10 billion American dollars for also Israeli army. Uh, and uh, what's it? But the point, the other point that I want to bring is exactly the point that you mentioned about Shirin Abu Akhti in a sense. How uh, the Israelis in the beginning said they said there was going to be an investigation. Then recently, I think uh, on the May 19, or uh, they said that there, were, there was no need to have uh, an investigation because there was a uh, there was no crime in a way that, uh, uh, and uh, recently also we heard this similar that there was a, the, although in the US there were something like 57 members of Congress and 24 members of the Senate who supported the idea of an investigation, fair and free investigation. In the beginning, there was no, we didn't see uh, hear anything from the administration. Yes, there was condemnation of the killing, but uh, it did, nothing happened beyond that. But yesterday, apparently, there was a conversation between uh, Secretary Blinken and Secretary, uh, Mr. Uh, Gantz, and there was mention, at least for the first time, of accountability. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see if anything, if this is going to be translated to 
uh, a reality. By the way, uh, Shirin Abu Atli spoke here from the same podium about 10 years ago. And I was moderating that uh, that panel, and she was amazing because she spoke yeah. about yeah. what was happening, the way the Israelis make it very difficult to uh, cover uh, the stories of that are going on. Also, she mentioned a number of uh, incidents where a number of journalists were killed. Uh, uh, and apparently the number is quite large, which many people here are not aware of. Uh, there are probably over 50 uh, journalists. Yeah. And even during the last Gaza uh, attack, one of the first buildings that was, were targeted was the building where the, there were offices, of media offices. Uh, so there's apparently uh, a deliberate uh, effort to, to prevent, because as you pointed out, uh, you were talking about the changes that have taken place. Well, even in the United States, there seems to be changes among within public opinion. We're hearing a few more, still a small minority, but we're hearing more people speak out and show uh, more understanding. Uh, there, For the first time during the Gaza war, we heard from Asian Americans yeah. for, you know, supporting the Palestinians, from African Americans, from Latin Americans, and from as well as many white Americans. And more recently, we've heard about the three churches, major churches who have uh, consider that what Israel is doing is apartheid. So the idea you were talking about, uh, and part of it had to do, part of the reason, because they were becoming more aware, more aware, there was more contact with Palestinians. Apparently there was contact also with the churches, Palestinian churches who said, spoke of the discrimination against uh, the, uh, the Palestinians, uh, both Muslims and Christians, and also the what's happening to the sanctuaries as well attacks on the sanctuary so that is something that's quite uh, quite interesting but the point that you mentioned earlier i think that was very very important and I, is the idea of building bridges towards other people participating in politics as you said uh, so uh, but let me get to another question of it, is that uh, last last year uh, President Abbas basically addressed the UN General Assembly. Mm -hmm. and he said that we have to see a state, a Palestinian state, independent state within the June 1967 borders and with Jerusalem, East Jerusalem as its capital. Uh, well, and he said if that doesn't happen, we might like see changes where, uh, for example, we might see ending of the security co coordination drawing from the Oslo. A process that was talk about that when other Palestinian uh, 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 you know, uh, officials as well as uh, academics and intellectuals. There was talk about uh, maybe uh, pulling uh, back the recognition. Do you think is how realistic is this? And uh, let me ask you just in addition. And if I uh, uh, do you think how real is this issue of a Palestinian state? Uh, is it still viable to have a Palestinian uh, state today, to have a two-state solution? Uh, you know, first of all, you know, I remember once I was giving an interview on, on, on the Israeli television, and then they started attacking me and accusing me of supporting terror and so on. So I asked them, you know what? We don't want to do anything. We don't want to struggle against anything. We don't want peace or equality or justice or anything. You just tell me, no, like, just let me know when is it comfortable for you to end the occupation? Well, well, what do you have in mind as an Israeli when you are thinking about the occupation of my people? Just give me a date and we will stop any activity against the occupation till this day. But just give me a date. One year, two years, five years, 10 years. But tell me something that you want to end the Israeli occupation in the near future. And we will start waiting for this date. There is no serious Israeli talk about ending the occupation. On the contrary, they are talking about enlarging the Israeli apartheid all the time. Now, regarding the President Abbas talk, I think his talk in the UN was a very important talk. And a very logical one also. The world should, should, should give us uh, 
a date. When, when, when will, from the world's point of view, the Israeli occupation will be considered uh, too long? When will they start thinking that we had too much than enough? Uh, but nowadays, with this you know, very complicated Palestinian uh, political situation, I don't think uh, we can do a lot. First of all, in order to do something, the Palestinian leadership should again be unified under the PLO. We should rebuild our political institutions. We should have, we should have elections for our institutions. The Palestinian parliament must have elections in order to win its legitimacy again, to gain its legitimacy again, uh, we should, first of all, elect our institutions, our national institutions, our political institutions, and we should be united on an agreed Palestinian strategy that want to lead to anywhere. But all of the Palestinians will be represented in the leadership, and they will have to agree on a strategy. Without that, we really cannot do something serious. So the first thing is to end this division between Gaza and between Gaza and the West Bank, between Hamas and Fatah, and to bring all the Palestinian fractions, political fractions under the umbrella of the Palestinian PLO and to agree on a strategy that would lead the Palestinian struggle for the next few years. A, nothing is promising in the near time because things are getting very complicated, mainly with this a new Arab uh, Abraham Accords and with the strategic uh, planning between Israel and Saudi Arabia and a lot of things is, is, is changing. But I do believe that working on, in any, on, on the field in Palestine can do a very big changes. Yani the world can put all the pressure on the Palestinians and they can ask us to do whatever they like. If they will not be supported with Palestinian acceptance, nothing can work. And I think that we, the Palestinians, that are fighting for peace, or justice, or equality, we have very, very powerful statement, powerful political card that we can and use is that we can refuse. Any solution which is not built on justice, we can refuse. We do not have to, ag to agree on anything that will not bring us justice and equality, at least attainable justice. Okay, uh, and any unjust solution that will Israel will try to enforce on us cannot last for a long time. Palestinians have national pride and they will not accept their inferiority, never. No matter how things are looking very complicated and the political situation is not working for us, Palestinians are a very proud people and they will never compromise their national pride. Any unjust solution cannot last for a long time. And we will continue struggling for peace, justice, and equality for everyone, by the way, not just for the Palestinians. We believe that a just solution should be a just solution for everyone, for Arabs and Jews. And a democratic solution is good for everyone. We don't see when we are struggling for justice and equality and democracy. We don't see this thing and yani serving only the Palestinians. We see this as a better solution and as a more just solution for all the people who are living here, for Arabs and Jews, and also if there will be foreigners. It will take some time, but we should be building, first of all, on ending the Palestinian division and unifying the Palestinian people and political fractions on an agreed strategy. 
Absolutely. I think these are very inspiring words. And I want to thank you so much for taking the time. Sure. Yes, I, I like the, the analysis very, very thoughtful. And uh, you, you really gave us a lot of food for thought for the future. We really appreciate it and hope we thank can. You. Thank you. Thank you. Time in the future. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank you very much for this chance. Article after Dr. Gharib and all the others. Thank you. 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 Thank you.